I'm Al Filreis, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends, actually four this time in the world of contemporary poetry and poetics, to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of a poem. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for a poem that interests us, some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available or are about to be available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Penn Sound archive, writing.upenn.edu slash Penn Sound. Poem Talk has once again gone on the road. I, along with my colleagues Zach Cardner, Chris Martin, and Anna Strong Safford, joined for the ride by Lainey Brown. And we are happily here today in Providence, Rhode Island, at the lovely home of Rosemary and Keith Waltrip, joined by the aforementioned Lainey Brown, a poet and editor based in Philadelphia, whose newest book is In Garments Worn by Lindens, really new, as a matter of fact, published by Leanne Brown's Tender Buttons Press, and is an homage text for Rosemary Waldrop, and in particular, Rosemary's book, Lawn of Excluded Middle and whose many other books include Amulet, New and Selected Poems, Periodic Companions, a novel, a favorite of mine, The Book of Moments, Short Fiction, Daily Sonnets, You Envelop Me, etc., who edited a new edition of Bernadette Mayer's The Desires of Mothers to Please Others in Letters, a world-class book, and who I'm thrilled to say teaches creative writing as my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania. And by Monica De La Torre, Mexico City-born tr poet, translator, scholar, who has edited at BOM and the Brooklyn Rail, and is currently a professor of the practice in literary arts here at Provid in, in Providence at Brown University, whose books include talk shows and public domain and the astonishing work, The Happy End, All Welcome, set in a job fair inspired by the Nature Theater of Oklahoma in Kafka's unfinished crazy novel, America, so the largest theater company in the world is recruiting all kinds of employees. What a book. And by Kate Colby, Boston-born poet who lives right here in Providence and teaches at Brown University, whose new book is Dream of the Trenches, a work of critical poem essays, and whose previous books include The Arrangements, I Mean, Blue Hole, Return of the Native, Fruitlands, and others, and who has been a fellow at the Woodbury Poetry Room at Harvard, along with many other distinctions, and is a founding board member at the Gloucester Writers Center in Massachusetts. And by our welcoming host, we've been warmly welcomed today, Rosemary Waldrop, the eminent poet, editor, publisher, translator, a major presence in US and international poetry for more than five decades, but who's counting? Uh, who, with Keith Waldrop, in 1961 founded Burning Deck Magazine, then Burning Deck Press, one of the most influential publishers of innovative poetry in the United States, who is the leading English translator of Edmund Jabez, whose 20-some books, uh, poetry novels, books of criticism are always astonishing and include, just to name a few of my personal favorites, Shorter American Memory, Lawn of Excluded Middle, Split Infinites, a key into the language of America and her edition of Paul Ceylon's collected prose, just to name a few, and whose Penn Sound page, which I highly recommend, is full of really wonderful recordings of various riveting readings that Rosemary has given over the years. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for having us into your house. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it's really great to be here. And Lainey, thanks for coming along for the ride. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, and Kate for letting us hang around your house as well. I'm thrilled. It's great. Thanks and Monica, for coming. it's good to see you. You made it here up here from non-snowy New York. Uh, that's it? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we, we five have gathered here to talk about a poem in Rosemary Waltrop's great book, Split Infinites, which was published in 1998. I have a copy of it by Gil Ott's, the late Gil Ott's Singing Horse Press, then in Philadelphia, of course. So there's another nice point along the Philadelphia Providence northeasterly line. And the split infinite piece we'll discuss is the prose poem titled Memory Tree. Now Rosemary's pen sound page, otherwise ample, does not include any recordings of her reading the split infinite poem. So today our source for the audio of this poem is, well, Rosemary herself right here in person. So before we discuss it, here now is Rosemary Waldrop reading Memory Tree. 
memory tree. And secondly, in German. My first school day, September 1941, a cool day. Time did not pass, but was conducted to the brain. I was taught the Nazi salute, the flute. How firmly entrenched the ancient theories, already using paper, pen and ink. Yes, I said, I'm here. I was six or seven dwarfs, the snow was white, the prince at war. Hitler on the radio, followed by Lehar. Senses impinged on, blackouts, sirens, mattress on the floor, a furtive visitor or ghost. And mother furious, sirens, hiss, the cat, my sister cried unseen, her friend afraid to look. What did I know of labor, forced or pregnant? The deep interiors of the body? I had learned to ride a bike. The black cat, the white snow, the blue flower, a menace of a different color. Uniform movement with unsurpassed speed, not fastidious, not necessary for substance to be filled in deep inside. Mother, I cried extremely, and wolf, exceeding the snow I was at home in, wool, pull, wool pulled over my eyes. Oh, wolf, the boy who did not cry it also died. Twilight overtures. Face fair, black hair, hands parsimoniously on knees. A Polish girl, in Germany, in the war, Moving along swiftly in the air between us, a continuous image. Enough of black cat panic, bells, hells, shells of sirens, hiss of bombs. A long life of learning the preceding chapter. That my soul in blue jeans, my mother in childbirth, my rubble of hopes in German, east of expectation, west of still waiting. In bed with an antidote. Eating of the tree, leaves falling before the fall, through a hole in memory. The fruit puckers new problems, but doesn't quench. The orchard long abandoned. Lainey, how does it feel to be in the presence, in language and now here in the audio, of this approach, this kind of memory, this kind of assemblage of memory? How does it feel to respond to this? So many layers, you know, of emotional meaning and language, holding language inside of language, you know? I just wanted to listen and watch and see all at the same time. How would you say, Monica, this, um, Rosemary deals, what strategy does she use for bringing these memories together? Because well, obviously it's not um, straightforwardly narrative, right. obviously, and there's a lot of wordplay. Mm -hmm. Well, so much wordplay. It's delightful. To say the least. It's just such a joy, which is, which is so interesting, right? Because it's like the... the the wordplay is so pleasing, and yet there's like such a dark, dark content um, and, and history being referred to. Um, I'm really interested in, well, of course, the fragments, how they're, um, there's no attempt to really weave them together, but they keep repeating as if in the repetition, there's, there's something that just resists being incorporated into the poem and therefore keeps coming back. But it can't, it can't be narrated. But, but that, and secondly, in German, which of course, she was referring to a time in which she was speaking in German, not writing in English. So that, that break in the language is, is really fascinating to me. And also this, the perplexity with which the poem begins. And secondly, comma, in German. So this, in I don't know. Erase, as if we're... In the middle right. of the story, exactly. But also, it—I don't know if the secondly qualifies the in German or if it's addressing something else. Mm. It kind of just throws you off a little bit, which which is fascinating to me. Kate, we're obviously 
going to turn to Rosemary, who's right here. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if you would begin by helping us enumerate some of the um, mythic folk stories that are in here, a biblical story. There's a lot. It's all coming together. Yeah, it Where evokes um, the continuous presence of childhood, and it, or like it strips out the hierarchy of information so that we have fairy tale, and we have the biblical, and we have the immediacy of the war, but the the hierarchy is German pulled fairy out. tales, yeah. Grimm's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so it all becomes sort of on the same plane, and it is interwoven. Um, but the, none, none of it, the epicness is removed from all of it. Rosemary, uh, September 1941, well in June, the Nazis turned against the Soviets and broke the pack. So by September, the war had, now they had an Eastern Front. So this was a, I mean, even as a child, six or seven, so you were born in 1935, and this is 1941, you, you had both a child's sense of going about your day, and it's in here, but also you must have felt how dark the situation was. Yes. And that's what's here, isn't it? Well, that's in a way what the poem is about, that there was always crisis, there was always something going on that I didn't know what it was, so there was this sort of unease of things happening all the time, and yet, you know, I... I knew something and didn't know most of it. Yeah. You know? Can we take, a, it's actually a sentence, starting with you and then all of us, do a close reading of this sentence, which has both that knowing and the not knowing in it. The Nazi salute, the flute. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start with that? What's happening with that? It's amazing. Well, <laughs> um, that happened, you know, I mean... Meaning you're a little that, girl playing the flute. Yes. Um, actually, it was a recorder at the time, but but I was fine. But, you know, the first day of school, we were, there's all these children were herded into the schoolyard and we were made to salute. So that was the first act of school. This was, was actually your to, first school day ever. To learn how to say Heil Hitler. How do you encounter that rhyme, Laney? To me, it just makes me think of the absurdity of a situation where there's this exterior where things are just going on as if it's orderly, as if it's fine, everyday things. Kids are going to school, playing the flute, but it's the Nazi salute. And then the rhyme, to me, kind of hammers that absurdity mm -hmm. as if it yeah. were some sing-song rhyme, but it's not some sing-song rhyme. Well, two kinds of order in a way, you know, a, a very evil order and a good order, you know. Kate, you were going to say something. I was going to say that's echoed in Hitler and Lahar, and um, he wrote the Merry Widow Waltz, yes. right? Which is yes. like a <clears throat> piece of music every child is familiar with from cartoons and media, um, but to juxtapose those two things in that way is dramatic. Mm. Yes, the Lehar was always on the Mittags concert, a, a noon hour concert on the radio. It was always operettas and uh, light music, and so Lehar was a big part of that. Um, Monica, help. so let's move from the Nazi salute the flute to other examples in the language of this piece mm -hmm. that give us both the knowing and the not knowing, the child's view, which you can read as um, virulent dramatic irony. Mm -hmm. Well, I keep um, going back to the black cat, too. So there's like this superstition, right? And the... the, the, the uh, perhaps mis misdirected uh, fear, right, of a harmless cat when everything else is dangerous and so threatening. And, uh, but, but, but so it seems like there's a, an evolution from first the black cat and then the white snow, the blue flower. And then by the time the black cat appears, it's like the subject has had enough of it and, mm. and sort of recognizes what's going on or is about to. So enough of black cat panic. And then again, the rhyme, like bells, hells, shells of sirens, hiss of bombs. 
So um, I, f I feel like this is, is kind of going back to that opening. What should we call it? Stanza? Paragraph? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and re... Yeah, just going back on that and, and re the, the moving towards more specificity and, and, and attribution to where this uh, misdirection is happening. That makes any sense. It does. Mm -hmm. um, is there another, any, any of us, is there, are there other examples of the girl speaker of the first one, two, three, four, five, six, six stanzas who both knows and doesn't know? Other language that suggests that, Lainey? I feel like the in the second stanza, the there's this dislocation. Who is the speaker, right? Uh, I was six or seven dwarfs. There's, there's this. I feel like there's this attempt to kind of locate where one is, and this idea um, of time seems like a really important presence or even character in that's baffling in the poem. Time did not pass, but was conducted to the brain. I was taught. That's in the first stanza. So it's like time. Passive to teaching. It time when there's kind of disbelief of what's happening and not understanding, and time keeps going anyway. But it seems to not happen, or it's it being taught was something that happened to the person in the poem, as opposed to mm. a process they were involved in. Mm. Rosemary. Uh, the memories are exact, one feels, here. These, these, this all happened. Well, they are and they are not, you know. For instance, you know, the cat we had was not black, you know. Poetic uh, license you there. You know, of mm -hmm. course, you know, I, I play with, with that a lot, uh, with other things. Uh, so some of it happened and some of it didn't. When know. we encounter the Polish girl, it's unanticipated. That really has the ring of actuality. There was there was something. Well, my sisters were nine years older than I was, so they were 15, and they were drafted, one of them uh, in an ammunition factory and one in an anti-aircraft unit. Uh, you know, at 15, they were already drafted for the war effort. Um, and, um, and one of my sisters brought uh, a co-worker who was a Polish girl, and it caused uh, a big in, within the family, my mother was terribly afraid something might happen. This was not something she was supposed to do. And uh, and I think she was pregnant, but I'm, I don't remember really very well. But there was a whole sort of world around the Polish girl that came to the house. As we turn to Snow White, the boy or girl who cried wolf, and Eve, three, three big stories. Um, can we start, Rosemary, by asking you, is your, is your thinking about Snow White, was that contemporaneous, that Grimm's tale? Um, yes, also I, I was in a, in a play version of... Uh, what of, role did you play? Uh, a dwarf, of course. <laughs> you were the wolf? <laughs> no, a dwarf. Oh, a dwarf, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is quite literal then. So you, you were, were six or seven dwarf. How? At six or seven years old, you were a dwarf. Right, uh, exactly. Exact Except that that is not actually right again. That was after the war <laughs> that I was in this play. There was no school in 1945 in my area, but there was a, a local theater company that uh, hired kids to be dwarfs in, in oh Snow White. And we were actually in an, um, they had somehow gotten hold of an American army track, and we were going around all the little villages. And in the afternoon, we played Snow White for the kids. And in the evening, we played um, Vedekind's uh, Love Potion. <laughs> you know? yeah. In 45, after the war? Yes, in the summer. Of, yeah. This is a digression, but I have to ask you. Was there a denazified, anti-fascist, because one can read Snow White in that way, that liberation. Was there, did they put on that play as a denazified move? Or it was just Snow White. I couldn't tell. I think it was just Snow White. <laughs> well, let's let's try but, uh, to. Yeah. But fair enough. Was well, Snow White. <laughs> it becomes anti-fascist yeah. here. That's all that counts. What, yeah. So let's work on Snow White, the girl or boy who cried wolf, and Eve. Can we work those together, Monica? You want to start us off? Mm -hmm. How does that work? 
That's amazing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Amazing, amazing. Yeah, um, how uh, it's spliced, right? So you don't, the first time you encounter it, the snow was white, and then a couple paragraphs. And there's answered. a prince there that hints and the that prince, it's snow white. Right, of course. I was six or seven dwarfs, the snow was white. Of course, it's already conjuring snow white, but not so directly. And the prince is at war. And then further down, the snow is no longer white. It's, uh, well, no, you can see, I'm sorry. The snow is white in the second, stan second stanza. And then in the fourth, you're, you're, you, we go back to white snow. So I'm, I'm very interested in that. Again, then uh, further down, mother, I cried extremely, period, and wolf, period. For, further down, the boy who did not cry, it also died. It, the, the boy who did not cry, it also died, it being the wolf. So just this um, splicing and of, 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 of the fairy tale in a, in a way maybe to tease out uh, the implications of not crying wolf, for instance. So it's as if, so crying wolf Crying wolf is, is, a, is an imposture, but then not crying wolf is maybe even more dangerous mm. than crying wolf. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I, fi I find that ambiguity here very perplexing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lainey, Kate, where do we go from here with those three stories, which should add Eve in there, Eden? Well, Eve, um, I, her role in the end contrasts with the beginning where the speaker is you know, has this passive relationship to education and information where it's all being received and it too, in addition to time, conducted to the brain. And in the end, we have this act of Eve eating of the tree. And I love eating of the tree because it also asks whether the tree is also consumed. Um, but it's, a, it's an act of <coughs> seeking and digesting knowledge willfully as opposed to the to the program of education being forced upon the child. That's great. Um, Lainey, Rosemary, we have so much going on there with the eating of the tree, which is simulating the Genesis translation the way we do it in English is eating of. And then you have before the fall, which is an important phrase in the Genesis mm -hmm. story. And then you have September, and you have the fall of the Nazi regime, impending at this point because of the stupid, stupid from their point of view, mistake, thankfully from our point of view, mistake of turning against the Soviets, having uh, two fronts to fight. So leaves falling before the fall. You have all this, and then you have fruit puckers. So I guess the, since we have you here, the easy question would be, what did you mean? But I think we'll go to Lainey first. <laughs> what did you mean? You said a lot. So yeah, what do you wanna, I know. What do you, what do well, you ask? Why bring in Eve at that moment? Snow White Eve is a great pair for a little girl in Nazi Germany. I think why? Because at the end of the poem, there's a pause, there's an asterisk, and there's a shift from if we're in childhood consciousness then to an it's all adult consciousness looking back but in the beginning we're more in that childhood associations and memories and then there's a movement to and all these years later I'm still trying to understand this and so I associate adult consciousness with eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and this kind of humble epiphany that we I still don't understand it, this is still impossible to understand even with the adult consciousness. Mm -hmm. Rosemary, w why bring in Eve? Well, um, I actually associate the memory tree and the tree of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, in trying to remember what went on and trying to figure it out, that that was like, uh, you know, an acquisition of knowledge. Yeah. And actually that's also why I put the, and secondly in German, I mean, part of it was just that that sounded right, you know, mm. but uh, but it was also because I'm thinking of the memory tree as a tree of knowledge, and knowledge came to me first in Germany, you know, 
in German. Mm -hmm. so Are you saying that the girl at five or six had, an, had eaten enough of the memory tree to know no. enough of what was going on? Or no, was she totally no, innocent? no. The memory tree is the adult mm -hmm. that comes in at the end. Mm -hmm. you know. But you but invest in her a semi-knowledge of what's going on, of on around her. Just a sort of confused awareness of things happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is, uh, you know, it took me all of my teens sort of to figure out, to read up on what happened while I was happily learning to ride my bike, you know, so. Well, the memory yeah. tree is also branching like a family tree. So in the end, you're out that at the also, end of a branch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so all those stories, the fairy tales and the and Eve and the other um, ambient information are all twigs branching away yeah. from mm -hmm. yeah, the trunk. I read this aloud twice to a loved one after reading it and thinking about it. I read it in, originally in the book and then in preparation for this read it twice aloud. And in reading twice aloud, I got very emotional twice. One was I had learned to ride a bike. That was just a gut punch line. Mm -hmm such innocence there and productivity like I'm gonna we will have a life I will grow up I, I need to and also by the way you had to ride bikes because you know petrol was rationed this this was a learning how to ride a bike was a way of a kid getting around but then the right after the asterisk that stanza and we talked about that before we went on the air so I wonder if you would reread that stanza a long life of learning and then I invite our colleagues here to talk about that powerful piece. A long life of learning the preceding chapter, that my soul in blue jeans, my mother in childbirth, my rabble of hopes in German, east of, experience, east of expectation, west of still waiting. In bed, there's an antidote. Laney? What is the antidote? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. How does Snow White, how does Snow White yeah. go to sleep? But an apple, right? Isn't? Am I getting that the right? Yes. The poison apple. Yes. 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 So yeah. the 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 the, 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 the 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 apple that should be for Eve, the the way of becoming knowledgeable, is the thing that puts her to sleep. And the antidote is mm. Prince Charming. So that's what you're waiting for if you're in that story. Mm. <laughs> Holy I feel like cow. One question that I love about this is that it keeps pointing me back to the question of what are the stories and how do we exist inside the stories? How do we figure out who we are or where is safety? Sometimes there's this idea that if there's not safety in the world, there's safety in the story. But none of these stories have the safety. So I see like the child speaker trying to go into the story, but that's also dangerous. Like, who is the wolf? Who is, you know, mm. who am I if I'm fiction? Mm. And that's not safe. Wow. Mm. Top that, Monica. That was pretty great. <laughs> well, that was yes, pretty great yeah. what you just said. What I, are you thinking? I keep thinking that in bed with an antidote, yes, I thought, okay, it's Keith, but it's also English. It's who? What? English. Uh, Wait, the, the English what language. What would you say, oh, just Keith? Keith. Keith. Yeah. Keith. Keith Waldrop. Keith, Keith Waldrop. Right. Prince Charming. Yes. 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 Prince Charming. Prince Charming, but, but, after the war, right? <laughs> and he brought you away from Germany. That's right. Okay, yes. that's really important. Yes. We should just say but that, he was right? right? Just say it. But yeah. Prince right. Charming, also Keith Waldrop. Because I see the asterisk <laughs> as that break. Also yeah. with that, like, it's, it's like this, the speaker, Rosemary, exists, the, the antidote to the first lesson or the preceding chapter is the English language and that break with what came before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's That's that. Great. So the knowledge and that vision, that clarity and the antidote comes from the distance that. Kate, it's getting better and friends. better. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> I don't, I'm intrigued by a long life of learning the preceding chapter in this, mm -hmm. you know, this, always our attempt to move forward and look forward, but always having to take two steps back to revisit, revisit what's come before and to assimilate it into the process of moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rosemary, I'm going to ask you to explain. <laughs> west of Still Waiting can be read twi in two ways. One is, I am west of Still Waiting, meaning mm -hmm. I've gotten past Still Waiting because I've come west. Or, West of still waiting is I'm still waiting. 
Mm -hmm. I assume it's the former, but it's very powerful ambiguity. What do you make of that? I like the ambiguity, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, and I'm not going to settle for one. <laughs> if you're not still waiting in the Prince Charming sense, because you got your Prince Charming and he brought you to the United States <laughs> into, into English, but, are, but, you, but as an anti-fascist, you're still waiting, aren't you? I guess so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we say a little more about that in bed with an antidote? Who's going to wake us up? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, it's getting high time. <laughs> yeah. Let the record show that we're in this amazing room in this amazing house full of books, but there's also like a collage of stuff mm. behind us. You can't see it, but... And w there's a little button, a Bush-era button, and it says, Asses of Evil. <laughs> <laughs> so either Snow White or Prince Charming collected that button. Yes. The struggle continues. So how do you reflect on your life as a girl who went through Nazism and now you're a poet, bilingual, uh, and progressive in all, in all senses of the word, but poetically and otherwise, and you, here you sat down, it was some years ago when you wrote this poem, but here you sat down to put this memory together. And then the asterisk and then thinking about a long life of that preceding chapter, I invite you now to say anything you want about that long life of the preceding chapter. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is one thing, uh, I mean, I have thought, you know, it's my, my bad luck to have been born in, Germ uh, in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And, and now I'm living in Trump's America, and before that in George Bush's America, uh, always sort of on the wrong side, it seems. You know, well, no, they're, they're, I mean, there were good times in between. But, uh, but there is this persistence of, uh, well, of, I can't say it in a few words, you know. But um, well, I could say, for instance, um, when my when we were teenagers, and my classmates and I, um, we sort of talked about what had happened. One thing we sort of clung to was we all believed this had been so horrible; it can never happen again. And of course. Uh, the preceding chapter includes that it is constantly happening and has been happening ever since in various places of the globe, and uh, there seems to be no getting rid of it. You know? So, no matter how of how horrible things uh, people do to other people, I'd like us to focus for a second on the portrait of the five or six or seven dwarf year old girl portrait of the girl as a growing up in Nazi Germany young writer. I didn't do that phrase very well, but um, already using paper and pen and ink, period. Yes, I said, I'm here. That's quite a way to start this, Monica. What, what, so we're seeing the, the writer. It's being, she's remembering it later, but we're still seeing that girl. She rides a bike. She starts to be a writer. Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with th the rest of this? Why is that important? Yes, I said I'm here. Yeah, or, or her telling us already. That's a great word, already. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I am a person created right. in words. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why is that important here as part of this memory? Well, I, I see it as part of the indoctrination, right? It's roll call. It's like, yes, here, right? The child. But also, oh, okay. that's, that's how I read it. Oh, I was yes, thinking I'm of here. it as very affirmative. Oh, I, I read it as, as what you would do in the first day of school. Or both. Yes. Both. I mean, of course, <laughs> of, of yeah. course both. Yeah. But, 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 but I'm interested. I just keep, sorry, I keep going back to this. I sh I'm not sorry, actually, but, uh, <laughs> but I apologize because it's the third time I'm going to say it. But like, I'm here, that I, what I'm fascinated by is this I is not the I of that little girl who first went to school who's using paper, pen, and ink. Because this I is a, set, is a different self who's, revisiting this through a different language. I mean, and already, of course, the I is not that I because we know that we keep evolving and we're never the same person twice, not even from day to day. But I'm here. It's, it's almost as if in that little girl there was that perspective of the poet who Rosemary would become. 
here is very here, deep and powerful work. Yes, here is, yes. I'm here in the classroom in Nazi Germany, but also here. I'm taking note. Pen and ink. I'm here. Mm -hmm. You can have me anytime. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about how there's a lot of sense of dislocation and even mm -hmm. disassociation. Where am I? Mm. And maybe that moment of I am here and it's associated with pen and ink is associating language with agency and volition as mm. a way to begin to understand the stories. Mm. Writing as a counter-socialization in the middle of a totalitarian regime is a pretty powerful thing. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go twice around. First time I'd like to invite each of us, including the poet herself, to find a word or a phrase or even a sentence that you wanted to get into the record here because mm -hmm. it's just so great. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second time around, I want to just get final thoughts uh, mm -hmm. Something you came to this conversation wanting to say but didn't get a chance to yet. Mm -hmm. So first, Lainey, are you ready to pick out a, a phrase, mm -hmm. something you underline? Not Monica, yet. you got one? Not yet. Okay. Through a hole in memory, mm -hmm. um, which comes after eating of the tree, leaves falling before the fall. And I spent some time on that sentence, um, reading it variously reading the whole variously as a flaw or an occlusion or as an opportunity and oculus. Um, and I love that it, it holds both of those and it never settles on one meaning, whether memory impedes or elucidates history and the history of the self. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lainey, did you find one you like? Um, well, now I'm looking at the end. Um, to pick up on where Kate was speaking. Um, the fruit puckers new problems but doesn't quench the orchard long abandoned. And I'm thinking about how remembering or having knowledge doesn't necessarily make something resolvable or understandable. Mm -hmm. And that seems, the irresolvability seems mm -hmm. important. That abandonment is this kind of a downer ending, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But maybe not. No, I mean, well, I, mean, I think there's all, many thinking about different an abandoned orchard is sad, but. registers. I think it's more kind of uh, acknowledging the complexity, right, and and the challenge of kind of integrating um, understanding or trying to get from knowledge to understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monica, a line phrase. Yes, in the first stanza how firmly entrenched the ancient theories. I love yeah, that. Yeah, we haven't talked about the ancient theories. Yeah. What are they? Well, education, indoctrination, um, uh, and, and, and beyond that, what theories? Oh, God, do we really want to open that kind of worms? <laughs> <laughs> you mean in, in this conversation, in do this we want to talk about what kind of theories we're going around? Uh, yes, probably eugenics, not. Eugenics. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but but th th this, in the in the stanza in which there's the memory of the first day of school, collapses perspective. Right? How firmly entrenched the ancient theories. Of course, a child who went to school the first day doesn't know this. So this also anticipates the pessimism that the poem ends with. Mm. I think. Mm -hmm. Great, Rosemary. You want to pick out a, a phrase of your own that you'd like to talk about? Well, actually, my favorite uh, sentence within it is the one that Lainey talked about, you know, the fruit puckers new problems but doesn't quench. Mm. That's, That's a such a Waldrop line, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lain Lainey has already <laughs> said it all. <laughs> you know? Great. Well, I have one. Um, it's part of, a, part of a line. My rabble of hopes in German. Everyone, this is so cla This is a, such a classic reading experience of your work in a very positive sense. We will read rubble. We keep wanting mm. to read rubble there. Yes, yes. Um, in the uh, you know Paul Celan sense, uh, you know of the language has been rendered into rubble, and our job is to pick up the pieces or leave them leave them as fragments. But rabble. Well, hopes are more active than rubble, you know. Right. <laughs> hopes are always a rabble. And rabble of hopes in German. I mean, rabble rousing. Rabble rousing. Exactly. Yeah, right. Rabble, rabble of hopes in German. And in German, meaning in the language, can the language survive what's, what it was made to do, which is a Paul Celan question, 
among others. Mm. All right, great. So one more time around, this is your final thought, something you wanted to say. You came all this way, Monica from New York, Laney from Philly. Mm. It's in your notes, but we didn't get a chance to do it yet. So who wants to start? Maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm curious about the fact that this poem of, seems more legible than so many other poems of yours. I mean, here we've been talking about a particular narrative. So the fragments, despite the resistance to articulate them in, in a discernible narrative with, 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 with an evolution, a progression, et cetera, um, it, it's, it's, it's easy to track it. And, and, and your relationship to the, what is recounted in the poem. So I'm just very curious about the shift in mode. Like, why is this more accessible, more transparent than the poems in Lawn of the Excluded Middle, for instance? Is that a question to be left on the table, or is that a question you want Rosemary to answer? <laughs> why are you being so darned accessible in the poem? Is there something about this memory that requires a general human, humane accessibility? Is that what's happening here? Well, I think the whole sequence that this poem is from has these biographical elements. And actually, I was a little surprised that you picked this because it's really uh, not that typical, no. <laughs> uh, that sequence. Uh, you know, I'm usually... Split infinites. It's not typical at the level of the poem, but it's very typical at the level of the phrase mm -hmm. and uh -huh. word choice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I think the... Uh, biographical, autobiographical material made for more legibility, yeah, as you call good. it, yeah, more Kate, of a story. Sorry. Kate, final thought? My final thought is how beautifully this piece um, evinces how the self, either both from childhood to adulthood and from educated to learning, modulates in time mm. and kind with, with the historical forces of the world and history. Um, it, how it moves back and forth between the local and the global. And... Um, May or may not get anywhere in the end. There may not. I, it's the, there's a question of whether there's any kind of progress made either on the part of the individual or the forces within which it exists. Thank you, Lainey. Final thought. Yeah, um, I think at the same time that we're talking about biographical and narrative happening here, I think. The opposite is also true in that there is something about the invisible here that's, I think, in a lot of other work. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of this, um, my sister cried unseen and this afraid to look and the interiors of the body. There's pointing to what we can't, what can't be inscribed and the child experiencing what isn't being said is a very strong presence in the poem, and I feel like that's in a lot of your work as well, this what can't be said. And we get it from the poem, but it isn't said in the poem. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Rosemary, final thought? I am delighted and overwhelmed <laughs> by, by, by your reading of it, and I'm so grateful. And it really opened new perspectives, and uh, yes. Thank, Thank you. you all. That's wonderful. Thank you for writing Thank this you so much. wonderful poem. Yeah. Well, uh, I just want to toss my own little final thought in, and then we're going to turn to Gathering Paradise, so get ready for that. Um, I've read a lot about totalitarianism, and, what, and also at the same time done a long study of testimonies, survivor testimonies, uh, particularly focused on people who were children at the time. And... It seems to me that this poem and our conversation eliciting from you certain comments, um, I'm just recommending it as a really perfect example of what it's like to try to, to piece together a child's relatively innocent experience in a place of totalitarianism. It's a very special thing, for, to say the least, for a child to grow up in such a situation. I was taught is the 
brutal passivity of every child going through any kind of organizational education system, even in a wonderfully functioning democracy. But I was taught as in the passive in a situation like this is especially complicated and brutal and has long-term effects. And you're brilliantly and beautifully talking about it in this poem. Well, we like to end Poem Talk with a minute or two of Gathering Paradise, a chance for us to spread wide our narrow Dickinsonian hands. I don't know what she's doing in that poem. She's ne and then she's gathering, <laughs> she's gathering paradise. I think she might be praying at the end. But anyway, whether we're doing it that way or not, uh, to gather a little something really poetically good to hail or commend someone or something going on in the poetry world or the art world, who wants to recommend something first? I do. Blaney. I just found out that Wave Books is doing a book on Rosemary and Keith, and I don't have all the particulars, but it's... Oh, you <laughs> preempted me. Thank you. Oh, oh you beat me to wow. it. Did you want to do it together? Do it yes. together. Yeah. Hold Rosemary the book up. Rosemary and Keith Waldrop, Keeping the Window Open, Interview Statements, Alarms, Excursions, edited by Ben Lerner, with an introduction by Aaron Kunin. Wonderful. Gorgeous book. I just got it yesterday. I can't wait mail. to get it. Wow. It is, I got it at home. This is, ex it, it, I'm so excited to have this book. Wow. The, yes, and, and anyone can get it. It's hot off the press by way yes. Well, way yes, I got, mm -hmm. I got an advanced copy, but uh, I haven't gotten the others well, that I, oh, I have. Yeah, I've seen oh, okay. yeah. So, okay. so that was a double. I like that. that. Kate? Mm -hmm. I would like to recommend a new book called Principles of Economics by mm -hmm. Kristen Case, which just came out from Switchback. Um, and it's a beautiful, very moving elegy that um, it moves through ecologies of time and literary history and economic theory and has this tension between finitude and infinity that... Um, it's very moving. I highly recommend it. Rosemary, you want to recommend something or a person? Well, I've, I've recently been rereading um, Mamie Bersenbrook's The, F the Four-Year-Old Child. Beautiful book. Mm -hmm. And I was just as blown away as the <laughs> first time. Yeah. And I recommend anybody read that. <laughs> yes, I second that. OK, well, I have a couple of little shout outs. First of all, um, I, I was enthusiastic in introducing Monica uh, about the happy end, all welcome. I just want to recommend that to everybody. Such a good book. And Kate has two new books, but I just want to mention The Arrangements, which is a wow. It's such a great, intense experience. Highly recommend. And Lainey Brown, now I'm going to do something that, the, that, that Chris and Zach are not going to like. <laughs> okay, I'm going to invite Leanne Brown, who's been, is she, there she is to say <laughs> something about a Laney Brown book that is new. And here is mm. here's Leanne. Leanne, <laughs> let, let the record show that Leanne Brown has been here the whole time. <laughs> Thanks, tell, us about, tell us about Laney Brown, what she got going. Well, Laney has created a new form of homage text to the 1993 Lawn of Excluded Middle that we published of Rosemary's Rosemary book. Waldrop. And it's, um, I was thinking a lot about it with the line you were going over with the, there's an empty center in the poem you were just talking about, but this empty center of the um, excluded middle where generation of writing comes and, we, and revisiting um, a work and seeing, making a new work out of it. And Lainey has made a beautiful book called In Garments Worn by Lindens that Tender Buttons is publishing today. We're having Tender a book Buttons. party. Now, who has, do you have anything to do with Tender Buttons? <laughs> oh, it's my press. Yes. Yes. I was inspired by the Waldrops and many others. Thank you. Published. Thank I had you. to do that. It's such Thank a, you. this is such a beautiful convergence of everybody. Well, that's, that's all the eating from the memory tree we have time for on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House is a collaboration of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing and the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania and the Poetry Foundation, poetryfoundation.org. Thanks so much to my guests, Lainey Brown, Monica De La Torre, Kate Colby, and Rosemary Waldrop, and to Poem Talk's directors and engineers today, Zach Cardner and Chris Martin, and to our coordinator, amazing coordinator, Anna Strong Safford, and to Poem Talk's editor, the same Zach Cardner, and thanks once again to Rosemary and Keith for hosting us here at their home in Providence. And a shout out to Nathan and Elizabeth Light for their very generous support of Poem Talk. Next time on Poem Talk, we'll be back in Philly 
talking about Barbara Guest's poem, The Blue Stairs, with Kristen Prevalet, Simone White, and Mae Mae Ruga. This is the aforementioned. This is Al Filris, and I hope you'll join us for that or another episode of Poem Talk.